All right, very good. Anyways, uh, I'm sorry we're a little bit late, but, you know, we're having a vigorous uh, debate this morning about the cell signal, of course, and, of course, we're getting a lot of emails, uh, people uh, wondering uh, what the deal is. And I'll, I'll throw my two cents in real quick here. And there's a couple things going on uh, that I think creates some cross currents. And so it, as far as I'm concerned as a trader, it changes the way I look at the market. And I stop looking at as a stock market. I pay less attention to the indexes actually. And I treat it as a market of stocks. And I'm paying attention to individual stocks and looking at various setups uh, on the long side and on the short side if I see them. Okay, one problem there is I don't see a lot of things necessarily in position to short, but I'll get to some ideas there. Uh, assuming the sell signal pans out. But if you look at the market, what you're doing right now is we'll take the NASDAQ index, which undercut the low of last Tuesday. It did that on Monday of this week. And so if you're counting, uh, you know, there's kind of a weird, uh, a weird twist here. And I can remember back in 1997, 98, when I was at O'Neill, maybe you remember this, Dr. K. Uh, there was a big debate about when, a, when an index undercuts the prior low when do you start the count over for the number of days of a rally? And what you might notice here, let me see if I can bring this up. This closes, the close on this day is 2988.40, and the low here is 2987. So it actually closed above the intraday low of this day. And I remember a big debate back at O'Neill, back in like the late 90s, I think it was 97, 98, that this is not an undercut, and so you're still in rally mode because you did not close below the intraday low. To me, you're kind of splitting hairs. If you look at the S&P 500, whoops, get back up there. Uh, you're still in a rally attempt, but you know, this kind of looks like a little bit of, uh, of a, a little bit of a type of an ascending wedge type of thing going on. Uh, you know, it's not exact, but it's kind of a little rally like that. And so I'm wondering if this thing's going to fail, but so you're kind of a, you're in a correction. How do you approach it as a trader uh, of stocks, which I am? I take things on a stock by stock basis, and if I see something that's shortable, I'll go after it. If I see something that looks prime on the long side, uh, you know, like uh, LinkedIn or these uh, United Rentals, which uh, you know I have to eat a little bit of crow on that one because I always thought that was pretty boring. I mean, rentals are boring, but you have to look at the fundamentals and the technical action of the stock. Well, it's pretty good. And it's up today. You see uh, Apple's kind of retesting, hanging in there. So you see some stocks, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. The question is whether this thing breaks down from here. Now, what Dr. K is picking up in the model is that there is potential to break down from here. And so I don't think the, the sell signal is necessarily out of line. I do think, though, that you might be able to uh, go in a separate direction if you're dealing with individual stocks. And I think you see situations like... Um, this Red Hat, there was an article on TV last night that their uh, Glister program is, uh, or the company they bought, Glister, I think it's called, has some Facebook uh, people on their board. There's also Citrix Systems has people on their board, and that this uh, product that they have is what's going to be the new wave in, uh, I guess, networks like uh, Facebook's uh, social network. But you know, in expanding that, I guess it's a big part of Facebook's plan. So you see stocks like that acting well. Uh, you see uh, Yuri. I like this because it reminds me of a Russian friend I used to have, Yuri. But um, Yuri, as they used to say. But United Rentals is pretty boring, but nice shake up, break out, gap up. It's viable, you know, and, and you're using probably 44 level on the top of the base. But you see that is working. And I kind of like uh, old Seagate technology is also a shake out and a break out. You have the Bible gap up here, it looks like, and you continue holding up all right. It's interesting to see that acting well uh, as Western Digital bounces. And you see how this thing acts really sloppily. It bounces off support of the base here, right there, boom, fakes everyone out, violates the 50 day event, turns around and goes higher. So it's kind of like a market that wants to fake you out, moves in one direction, and uh, stops and moves in one direction for a period of time, and then pull back and uh, just flip you around. You can see the index is starting to come in a little bit here. So I don't think the sell signal is necessarily. Uh, a fader or something that's going to turn out to be wrong. I mean, our approach is if we, we have a, a series of wrong signals or bad signals, each time we come in uh, to exercise, you know, uh, orders in, in uh, inverse ETFs on a sell signal, if, if we're wrong once, we'll come back in the second time a little bit lighter 
and just try to cut down the little chips. But the thing is, if we get one good signal, uh, these small losses that you take on the, uh, raw, the the bad signals should be made up relatively quickly. Of course, that all is predicated on getting one good signal. In any case, Dr. K, I will turn it over to you for a second so you can go into uh, just what the hell are you thinking going to a cell signal here anyways? <laughs> Well, um, yeah, basically what you said is, uh, is exactly right. As we've illustrated uh, many times, when the model goes to a sell or a neutral, that doesn't mean you sell your stocks. Uh, this has been a market of stocks, and leading stocks can often buck market weakness and market uh, downtrends and market trendlessness. So uh, hang on to your stocks. Keep your stops as they are. Um, now, in terms of quantitative easing, which began in 2009, uh, their markets had two major corrections. The first one was in May of 2010, the flash crash, and the second one was in August of 2011. The model caught both of those corrections. Now, outside of those two hugely profitable sell signals, the models had a number of sell signals that were only minorly profitable or false signals, in other words, losses. Um, there were small losses, but losses nevertheless. And in studying market pullbacks since 2009, uh, the minor pullbacks, they usually occur very quickly. Um, what The market might sell off in a handful of days and then QE or whatever force will step in and prop the market and the market will then, lo and behold, go higher. It will often go higher on weak volume, but it will go higher nonetheless. So uh, the model that it has adapted to QE in 2009 has now also adapted to this selling frustration um, because the markets prop themselves uh, through some various forces and, and probably most likely QE forces. Therefore, future sell signals are probably going to be more short-lived in the sense that when the market, say the market were to have a sell-off in the next few days, the model would probably anticipate some sort of, uh, it, it's going to be looking at various indicators to see to confirm this, but it's probably going to cover its position and take profits um, in future sell signals uh, a lot more quickly than it has before. Um, and again, um, if, it, if it had done this in May of 2010 and August of 2011, it still would have reaped those gains because those markets fell apart, again, in just a handful of days. The sell-offs come very furiously and, uh, and fast. Um, and so uh, that is the uh, adaptation that the model has uh, taken into account. Yeah, so I think you know the thinking is reasonable here, and I think if you're going to go with a sell signal, you're better off hitting it. You notice how you're coming up. This is this now. You're coming up in this former area of support here, okay? So you're coming up into this area, and I think if you're going to get a good sell signal, this is probably a better spot to hit it rather than waiting for it to break. And if there are enough factors for Dr. K to make that move in the model, or the model makes that move, I'm assuming Dr. K that you don't sit there. Uh, you know, throwing the, the bones to see what the bones tell you. Um, there's a rationale <laughs> behind it, as you First just explained. So, uh, what, was, what movie was that from? I, I forget. Uh, Roll the Bones, Roll the Bones. Or is that a, uh, a, a Rush song, anyways? Um, in any case, I think you're in a better spot here trying to go after inverse ETFs here and uh, using a fail safe that's probably pretty tight in here on the upside. But there's potential for us to go lower. Uh, I could see us testing the 2900 here, 2900 level on the NASDAQ, and probably this is 1340, these lows down here. Um, uh, let's see, I'm not doing too well with this. It's, somebody needs to teach me how to use this. Uh, but anyway, you can see you get the idea. So probably come down in here, and that would make sense. Already, though, you have seen the uh, New York Composite has already undercut this low. And then you rallied after undercutting that low. And you notice this was actually the day of the sell signal. So uh, you know, even on that day, we had some vigorous debate. His idea was that, yeah, the market is generating an objective sell signal, but you might be able to override on the basis that you're undercutting these lows. The NASDAQ at the same time was hitting uh, the 50-day here. And so you know, the, you could have uh, said that oh, well, we should hold off or whatever, but then you did roll over again. So. Uh, it, it's you know it's a little this a little that and the movements in here are not really enough to tell you that there's any real trend one way or the other. What you're trying to do is catch a break that takes you down pretty good uh, pretty quickly, and that's really the idea. So you kind of have to focus on that concept and and have some patience in terms of dealing with it and do things methodically. So for example, 
for those of you who are familiar with the Virtuous Selfish Investing Managed Account Program, we had one uh, signal that we took positions on and we bagged out and lost a couple, three percent. And then we come back in, the second time we'll come in a little smaller, maybe half as much and let it see if it works for us. Um, because if it does work, it should work quickly and produce decent gains. The only thing is you don't want to get too far behind the eight ball uh, when that happens. So, yeah, it's a little tricky and uh, that's pretty much how you deal with it. But you know, we don't try to second guess the model other than deciding that uh, you, know, you want to cut your positions down or not come in as aggressively and maybe soft pedal a little more. But you could get into a period where you have several good signals in a row, and if you're too timid, you're going to miss out on huge profit opportunities. Um, do you take long positions in stocks with MDM uh, giving a sell? Well, I can tell you that right, right now we have positions actually on the long side. If the MDM gives us a sell signal, we'll hold the long positions and take positions in inverse ETFs uh, or even you know short stocks. Uh, I will do that if I'm long, say, LinkedIn, Intuitive Surgical, URI, STX, you know, a couple of stocks like that. Fran is another one that's acting pretty well. Um, and we have that on the pocket pivot, it's moving up. You know, we'll stay with these, but you might come in and buy, you know, some TZA or TWM uh, or, for those of you who are nuts, uh, the UVXY. Um, it's a great way to make a lot of money fast. Also, a great way to lose a lot of money fast. Uh, Dr. K, what is the stop? Now you're you got a new model. Um, <clears throat> you're talking about TVIX. Yeah, and what is the stop on that? I mean, wow, that looks pretty pretty cheap right now. I think I'm gonna buy a thousand shares. Is that way the only amount I can lose is seventy seven. Well, that, that's <clears throat> that, that's a good question. And as I illustrated in um, in the in the uh, report that I sent out, it's incredibly volatile and I can't emphasize that enough. In other words, uh, the stop almost is meaningless on a TVIX trade. TVIX trades are going to be are going to tend to be very short lived, and uh, you're, you know, in intraday these same things, this TVIX can swing huge percentages. So knowing that, you should position size accordingly. That's why I uh, recommended that people use a maximum, absolute maximum, of ten to twenty percent position size in TVIX, and that might even be too much. Because you know, as I illustrated, some of these signals, um, the TVIX signal, some in one signal there was, I think, for, uh, you know, you can lose forty-six percent in one signal uh, because the, the swings are so wide, and then the model switches back, you know, or it switches back to cash. So you got to keep that in mind. That uh, you know, this is it is like playing with fire. But if you're only doing five or ten percent positions, then it's never going to kill your account. And the benefit, obviously, of the massive risk is that the reward is is you know seemingly off the scale. So I'm very curious to see how the these signals play out in the TVIX um, in the weeks ahead. Uh, given everything that I've looked at, it looks very promising um, compared to you know. I think people uh, probably remember last August when this model went to a sell signal on August second. And the model had five true signals in a row. And if you looked at TVIX, which we were we were uh, we were tracking TVIX at that point, over those five signals, TVIX was up something like 525 percent, something something crazy like that. Had you bought or shorted the TVIX on every buy and sell signal issued by the model. Um, now the problem after that point <clears throat> was that there were the risks were not in check with what the model does. The model is a longer term approach. TVIX is a much shorter term. So this new model, this new TVIX model is designed to capture um, quick gains in the TVIX, but these quick gains can sometimes be, you know, easily be 20, 30, 40 percent in one signal, and that can occur over a period of just a few days. So the idea was to rein in the risk while maximizing the reward, and I think based on what I've studied and what all the results have shown, um, uh, I've been able to, uh, to achieve on paper, and now it's a question to see how it performs in real time. Right, so you want to keep that in mind. So far, it's whatever's been achieved. Put that under around quotes around it, and keep that that's that's all theoretical and on paper. So how this thing works out because the volatility it's hard. I've traded the UVXY, and the volatility in these is nuts. But if you get a nice pop, you know, two three bucks on these, you can take it real quickly, and uh, and bag it. So. Uh, you know, for myself, th these are just high velocity things that are tough to trade on a trend because of the movement and you know where your stop is. So I think you're taking a smaller position to begin with, but uh, wild vehicles. So, anyways, um, 
somebody asking what's going on with buying the TVIX. Uh, we just talked about that. I was somebody's asking if F5 is a viable gap up. I would say no um, because of this sort of shape, but it's coming out of there. And, you know, they didn't really announce much in the way of uh, great guidance, but it shows you that uh, some of these stocks, they're just going to take them up. So you have this stock acting very well on a viable gap. Would you say that's a viable gap up, Dr. K, or do you think this movement here is a little bit suspect? Yeah, it's a little suspect because that prior gap down. Also, if you look at the overall base, it's not my favorite looking pattern. If you look at um, how the market has performed this year, it's been in a in an uptrend, um, and whereas F5 has been kind of slow uh, relative to the to what it should be. So I, I see it as kind of a, a weaker stock at this point. If if it shapes up and it completes this basing pattern and and then has a pocket pivot, um, then it could it could be actionable at that point. But I think it's premature. And you know this, this plus side of this stock is that it, you know it's an incredibly strong industry group, um, but uh, that's not enough to tilt to tilt my uh, my view into uh, buying this thing. Right. Um, here's a question for you: In this market direction model, sell based on leaders of Apple and Priceline. Why would you not gear towards inverse ETF of the QQQ? Wouldn't they come down more than TZA? Yeah, as I said in my uh, report. Um, these these leading stocks like Apple usually take a while to round out their tops. I mean, and I'm not saying that Apple's topping. I'm just saying if it's topping, it's not going to just come straight down. You're going to have so much in, so much in, uh, many institutions coming in and supporting the stock. So uh, therefore, on that basis, I uh, weakness begets weakness. And Russell 2000 has been the weak index compared to the Nasdaq 100. So I think you got more. If the market's going to get weak here, you're going to get more bang. For your buck with uh, with the Russell 2000 related ETFs, inverse ETFs. Yeah, I'd, you know, if you look at a stock like Apple, for example, you have this pullback, and and what this is really, you can see it on a weekly chart. You just come right to the 10 week, which is equivalent to the 50 day on the weekly chart. There's a little bit of difference, obviously, because the 10 week is calculated on the closing price of each week for 10 weeks on a moving average basis. Whereas this is calculated every day, so the the ten week will tend to be a little higher for stocks trending higher on a weekly basis, like Apple is. Notice it closes at the peak every week, so you can see that the ten week is a little higher than the fifty day, but you've got support right there. So there's the first pullback to the fifty day or the ten week moving average in the move, and you see on the pullback here, it's kind of hanging out here. So this is a retest. My guess is at best Apple needs to build its base here, and it should. That's a great move. I mean, look at that move on a weekly chart. You know, what more do you want? And uh, for it to go sideways here would be constructive for the market. Uh, if it tops and rolls over, <laughs> that's a possibility too. But for now, you know, the, it seems like the Nasdaq stocks, the big stocks, they they hold up better. If they start to break down, I think you'll see the the Russell come down along with it. So I don't really think you have to try and get too tricky necessarily thinking that because if the market comes down they got to hammer Priceline and Apple because they don't really have to. Um, somebody says uh, you take long positions. I think I answered that. Yeah, yeah, we'll take long positions. Like I said, treat the market as a market of stocks. You know, that said, uh, there probably could be some short position. I'm looking at one. I actually hit this one earlier this morning uh, above 109. You can see CAT uh, is coming in up into the 50-day moving average. You have made a couple of so this may not do anything. It may go sideways and then come out again. That's a possibility. But if it's going to break, it'll break from here. So I like this setup. Amazon is another one we've been keeping our eye on, and we noted that it has been around the 50-day. You're not getting much volume either way, but notice today you are reversing off of the opening. I did short this one. Notice how it bounces to the 20-day moving average and starting to come in a little bit. So is CAT. So those two are actually working. I see CAT. As a uh, <clears throat> potential pod type situation, and there's a few of them, but I also thought F5 could have been one as well because you can see there's a big move and you see this big pod like thing. Now it's broken down, it's holding below the 10 week. Even this rally here in CAT takes you right back up into the 10 week line, uh, right into the 50 day here. So, you know, it, it, that's a position you can come after. If it's going to roll over, that's probably where it's going to do it from. So, I'll go ahead and do those. And if you do have some long positions, you know, and LinkedIn is still up on the day, but it may come in. The market's starting to weaken, so I don't. You know, you may just be at the top of the range. You're going to pull back again. I notice it's held the 20-day, but 
uh, not ready to get aggressive in this thing just yet. They come out with earnings next week, and it's possible, to, you know, I may just want to trade this, channel trade this from one end to the other. And it seems like that's the way this market is. If you buy strength, two days later that strength is coming in, like uh, LinkedIn with the pocket pivot here. It looks like it's breaking out, makes a new high, and then wham, it comes in with the market, but it holds above the 20 day and actually roughly at the 10 day, so, and well above the 50 day, which is catching up. And if you're long as you're trying to hold it, I guess you could use the 50-day moving average. But you know, be advised, I, I'll be in there flipping it back and forth and trying to chop it back and forth on these moves in here until it breaks out because it's still choppy. Um, looking at some of these other names, the URS, you know, that's uh, not URS, URI, still holding up fine today. Um, Fran is still up. So some of these names are holding up okay. You know, if the market comes off, they're going to come down and test. Uh, Probably test their lows and, and maybe build bases, but nothing, uh, <clears throat> nothing, uh, you know, bad or necessarily uh, stupendous in terms of a big move. It's probably coming off the lows and just hanging out. Um, somebody says here. So when you don't come in as strong in the initial thing, when do you know to increase your positions? Well, once you develop a little cushion, you can start to add, but you kind of want to see things work for you. Uh, first and develop a little cushion. So what you do when you're coming in is you have a smaller position, let that build a little cushion for you, and then you can come in and add with the idea that if you get pushed out, you're you're going to have uh, some cushion to to uh, offset that. Okay, and perfect. But that's pretty much how you do because you can't keep coming in with a full position every time and get dinged two three percent. You do that three four five times in a row, and you're going to be down pretty good. So you have to manage that risk. <clears throat> Somebody asked, how does a model adapt for QE? Is there is have you discussed that already, Dr. K? Yeah, in prior reports, um, you know, in 2009, uh, you, you know, you can get the the the, the Fed, um, you know, the Fed websites will talk about, you know, how much they're injecting in. Also, you can take a look at, uh, you know, what's going on with the Bank of England and also um, <laughs> the uh, the ECB, <clears throat> the European Central Bank, right. in terms of how much money they're allocating. Um, and you get a general sense of how you know how aggressive are these central banks being in terms of uh, printing money, and you know they are aggressive. They're being very aggressive. There is a saying, "Don't fight the Fed." But that said, you can capture a lot of profit in a short amount of time by being on the right side of the sell signal. Um, and, and May 2010 and August 2011 are certainly illustrative of that. And I think going forward, uh, that you know the the, the the real key with with selling and shorting is not to get greedy. So when the market starts to blow apart, don't think it's going to keep going down. I'm mean, just, you know, if you got five, six, seven days of, uh, of a down market, just, you know, walk away, take your profits. And then, uh, and then let's, and then wait to see what happens. And usually what will happen is, what has con consistently happened since 2009 is that the market regains its footing. And uh, that footing is probably um, propped by, uh, you know, the forces of QE. <clears throat> Couple of questions here. Uh, can you discuss a low-level pocket pivot? I mean, it's just a pocket. What is a low-level pocket pivot? Is this a low-level pocket pivot? I guess it's occurring in the lower part of a base. There's not really much to discuss if it shows the the right characteristics of a pocket pivot and it's in a reasonable spot where the stock has been trying to move sideways. It seems okay with, uh, to be to be uh, buying those. Um, but other than that, there's nothing really special about a low-level pocket pivot. Dr. K, you got anything to comment on that? Uh, it, it comes down to the quality of the price volume action leading up to that pocket pivot. So the 10-day and the 50-day moving averages are two key moving averages in terms of pocket pivots. And so yesterday's action in, in Fran was certainly, um, you know, certainly a, a, a proper, a proper price volume action. Um, uh, it bounced right off the 10-week moving average on volume, and uh, and it it, it did a secondary offering and, and it was strong all day, so it didn't do anything wrong. It was it was one of those flawless, what I would call a near flawless pocket pivot. Yeah, and, and you have to take the position there because your stop is better than having a pocket pivot up here because you're near near to the 50 day. So it seems like it's a lower risk position to come into. But you know, there are certain parameters. There's really no difference between a low level pocket pivot and a high level pocket pivot. They're just in slightly different positions within the base, but as long as the Conditions around the pocket pivot are proper. In other words, it comes down, but you bounce once, and you're you're trying to move sideways off the 50-day here. That's constructive, and so it's coming off of the 10-week to some extent here because you're coming right off the 10-week on that right there. So you're you know you're basically seeing that. So there's not too much to discuss in terms of getting tricky. 
it is there. So Apple does report on next Tuesday. So yeah, that is a wild card. Somebody points that out. SXC. I know it's a lot of the help. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to say though on the pocket pivot issue, um, not to confuse. You know, low level. I don't like that because it almost makes it sound like a bottom fishing situation. And right. you stay away from bottom fishing pocket pivots when you're in a uh, when you are in an uptrending market because those are going to be junkier stocks and you're much better off hunting for the leaders. If the market's had a correction, then that's a different story and you can go for bottom fishing pocket pivots in leading stocks like ISRG in 2009 or Baidu a number of times. Um, so, you know, in terms of, I would look at pocket pivots not as low level, I would just look at them in terms of how constructive is the action leading into the 10 day or into the 50 day moving average. Anyways, SXCI, you know, healthcare, I guess you uh, some of the healthcare's have been doing better. I think that Obamacare is out the window. I don't see how, how, uh, you know, the smartest president ever is really making any coherent arguments from what I've read about what the attorneys for the government are saying in that case. It's almost a joke. So, um, and I'm glad that he's a constitutional expert uh, who understands that it's not the Supreme Court's job to change legislation that might be unconstitutional. Um, I, I'm actually shocked that he made a statement like that. And anybody who thinks he's the smartest president ever needs to rethink that one because he's either the biggest liar or the biggest idiot we've ever had in the office and that's saying a lot because you get a lot of liars and idiots uh, among politicians. In any case, it, this thing's moving. Is it viable? I, I guess you could have bought the gap. That's huge volume. I think, was there a secondary there? I, I bet you there was a secondary in there. Dr. Dave, what are you, what are you showing? Uh, it looks like it. Well, let me see. It's just like Fran oh. did a secondary. Uh, Tibco is another one. They did a secondary yesterday, and you get this big volume. They actually did convertible notes. Uh, yeah, which I think it's that, that's uh, that's two thousand percent over the you know the normal volume. So that that seems like there was some kind of secondary going on. Yeah, it has to be. So that's probably what it was. But you know that could be considered a viable gap if you want to go after it, and it's working so far. So Dow is now turning red. I'm expecting you'll see some other indexes. So you know I would get. I know some people, uh, they want to get all huffy about the signal, like we're not supposed to ever give another signal again on the market direction model, and you know, some people, well, this is this is the last chance, and blah, blah, blah. You know what, if it's the last chance and you and it doesn't work, the next signal will probably be the one where everybody makes the big money. Well, you know, if you remember July of 2011, that's that's where, you know, some you know we got a couple emails like, oh, you know, this, is, uh, this, is, this model doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, August... You know, August for five signals, the the model more than made up for all those uh, all those little losses. Yeah, and then actually some of those people came back, they rejoined. But you know, it, it doesn't. It's not good to you know join, quit, join, quit. Uh, I think it creates probably some volatility in in one's account. Yeah, and especially after you get like last year, we had five good signals in a row, and of course everybody comes running in on those, not really considering that there may be some reversion to the mean after you get five good signals in a row. Uh, but chasing performance is something that pikers do all the time. Um, so, you know, don't let yourself be one of those. If you're staying with it, you know, figure out how to handle the risk and uh, have some faith that you will eventually have a good signal that will allow you to score big and make up for all those little dings. So, but, you know, ultimatums, I think, are just hilarious. So it's like, uh, okay, we better make sure that the next signal works or else... Someone's going to cancel their subscription. Well, if that isn't a stupid reason to not give a signal, I don't know what is. Uh, big breakout and tango happening. Wango tango, there it goes. Um, you know, this stock, we had the stock, we didn't like this on this shakeout. I mean, that's kind of funky, but it's breaking out, you know, and it's trying to come out of here. Uh, looks like it's a clean breakout. So here you have a stock acting well in the face of. Uh, a sloppy market, but we've been following that for a while. We didn't like this, so this is kind of bizarre when this happens. And uh, fortunately, uh, we didn't get caught in this or sell out on this. We did get hit on that on on save when it did this. But you know, these stocks that do this, I, I don't know what's up with that. It just seems to me a function of very sloppy market making. Uh, speaking of which, actually, somebody asked, you know, does your model account for whatever they did in the TVX uh, a few weeks ago? I think what they did is it wasn't in sync with the VIX or something, and they decided to bring it down to fair value with the VIX or something like that. And so you had this big gap down break, and if you were long the thing, you got hosed on that basis. Is that right, Dr. K? You know, uh, uh, the, as far as the TVIX is a very strange instrument um, in, in terms of that, that kind of action. It do, don't expect it to correlate with the VIX um, a whole lot. It, there is rough correlation. 
but there's a lot of uh, strange, you know, cross currents that go on in it. And all I care about is what what is the price fall in action telling me um, in terms of this TVIX model. That that's all that matters. And, and the reasons behind why it might decouple or do some funky spin out things, it's pretty much irrelevant because the price the price volume is is very key in terms of these uh, these indices. Yeah, but I think it points out kind of the strangest of these ETFs and how they are riskier. You know, there's big reward if you catch them right. And I've had a couple of days where I'm long the UVXY and it runs up three bucks, and that's beautiful if you're in it big. Uh, and, but you got to run out of it very quickly. So it, you know, I think it all it's just testimony uh, the fact that these are more uh, risky. Somebody says, "What would you do with Tango?" If someone if someone's got a five or ten percent position and it runs against them by thirty percent or forty percent. And then they close out. You know, it costs their account. Well, it's a five percent position. Costs their account two or three percent. The idea is to trade such a small and a small enough position in TVIX so that you're not going to get scared out of the position prematurely, even if it has a wild swing against you intraday. Um, because uh, the idea is when you catch enough of these good good signals, and and from what I've seen, there's ample numbers of good signals that are incredibly profitable. So once you start to Actually, profit on that whatever the size position is five percent, ten or ten percent, and you start actually you know noticing your count equity start to increase. You know if you have a forty percent increase on a five percent position, that's a two percent gain. If it's a ten percent position, it's a four percent gain in your account. And if you do that enough, um, and these signals are pretty quick, the, the way they occur, um, you, that that small starting five percent position can can grow to f about ten, fifteen, even you know twenty percent of your account. Over right, so placing a making a small bet. With hopefully a big payoff. So you know if that's what you're into and you're going to try and do that, then that's how you would handle that, and that's how you handle all the queer behavior with these uh, ETFs. And I'll, I, actually, the other thing is, and this is what I really like about what what the results have shown, the paper results. The, and I, I want to stress this is on paper. Okay, it's not real time. We did the first real time signal today, but the paper results have shown that if you started with say five percent position. You know, or ten, let's say you did ten percent. Over time, over a period of several months, uh, the gains run up into you know several hundred percent. So if you started with a ten percent position and you had you know over several months, you're, you're up six hundred percent on a ten percent. That has increased six sixty percent, you know, fifty fifty sixty percent to your overall account value in several months, which is massive. And that that's what I love about this 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 model and the way it seems to uh, seems to work. <clears throat> Do you use intraday charts to time your entry? Not really. No, I don't. I I used to look at intradays all the time, but they're just noise. I mean, you have a position, you take it at the right spot, and forget about the intraday. So let me ask about: Is this Mellanox? I, I, is that a viable gap up? Uh, let's see here. I guess it is, but that one's way up there, and you're way up there. So if you buy it in here, your 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 risk is way down here. That's not that's not acceptable. So I'm not really playing that one. But you know you have to think about this. It's not rocket science. You know, like we don't have some special uh, indicator that tells us when something's extended. You can just see it on the chart. If this is your stop on a buyable gap of 55, stops trading at 62. That's well over 10 percent. Uh, above the low, so if you buy up here and you just you know do the math in your head, it's not based on an opinion. Uh, if the thing yanks back to here and you you're undercut, what are you taking? You're gonna take ten percent plus another one, two or three, uh, based on some porosity here. So it's very risky buying here, okay? And there's no magic answer like, oh yeah, you can buy it up here, it's okay, as if we know that that's the case. So I, I think that question. Uh, tells me that the person doesn't understand how a viable gap up is handled, and they don't understand basic risk relative, uh, you know, based on your entry relative to where your stop is. So the higher you are away from, or further away you are from your stop, or what you're using as your selling guide, the higher the risk. So you have to gauge it that way. Um, there's no magic answer like, oh no, it's okay. <clears throat> TVX not marginable. How am I supposed to put 200% of my account in it? Who said? Uh, oh, somebody says worst president ever. Uh, at least in my lifetime, he is clearly, and the guy spends more time campaigning than anything else. Um, you know, but 
VMware comes out with earnings and stock gaps up. I, I don't like this as a viable gap up, meaning because this is kind of a sloppy pattern. The overall pattern is kind of choppy. It's coming up out of there. It's been acting well, but it's like F5. So, you know, I, I don't think I'd be buying it. Can you comment on the danger of setting stops too close? I, I think you only know if a stop is too close after the fact. If it hits, if they take a stop down and hits your stop, then turns around and goes higher. Um, <clears throat> you know that that that's just what happens, and there's no way necessarily to deal with that. Um, the basic idea of the stop is that's just as much as you're allow, you're going to allow yourself to lose, and that's really the whole idea. I don't think there are magic stops that guarantee that. They're either too close or too far. So, um, <laughs> right, Dr. K, would you agree with that? That sounds about right to me. Okay. So, he's, what the heck was Ted Nugent talking about on the election and ending up in jail if the smartest president ever wins? I don't know. I haven't. Uh, I like Ted Nugent's music. I, I don't think any musician or actor really knows WTF they're talking about when it comes to politics, economics, or anything else that exists in the real world. I think they're just generally either outstanding and talented musicians or actors, and that's about it. But because they have a bully pulpit, uh, given their uh, ability to attract the media's attention, like Ted Nugent, and uh, you know, I think Ted is honest. Uh, he's an honest character, and I think Obama is the biggest affirmative action liar on the freaking planet. But you know, that's just my opinion. So you know, Ted, Ted reminds me of uh, Frank Zappa. You know, both of those guys. Fred, I'll never forget Frank Zappa uh, going after uh, Tipper Gore when she was leading yeah. Congresses back in the 80s. Congresses attack uh, when they wanted to put yeah. warning labels on albums. Okay, on albums back then, I remember they're trying to make out uh, Frank to be some sicko. And of course, Dr. K, your dad knew Frank very well. Frank, you know, just an average guy from San Bernardino. He played, he played with, uh, Frank wanted oh, him to be the lead, lead guitarist for Mothers of Invention. I mean, he jammed with those guys back in the yeah. 60s. So you dad knew the guy, but the, you know the guy was normal at home, and he's even telling Tipper Gore, "Yeah, you come to our house." You know, she thinks you know they got some big S and M show going on at the house, and a bunch of freakos hanging out there. Um, and and you know he says, "Come on over, you can play Nintendo with us, you know, or shoot hoops in the backyard." And your dad used like, to say that that Frank was one of the most, if not the most, level-headed person uh, uh, people he knew, you know, in music, and you got a lot of wing nuts. No drugs. Music. <laughs> No drugs, didn't drink. The guy was straight as down and, and a genius, and a musical genius. But anyways, we're kind of getting off track. But uh, Ted is kind of like Frank in that regard. I think Ted's uh, <clears throat> Ted's just outspoken, but I think he's honest. He's not feeding people BS. Um, save and Tango price drops allowed market makers to clear out stops for order flow prior to the move higher. Exactly, and they did what what they did. There were probably a lot of uh, mechanical stops set in there. And uh, they just took them all out. So I, we didn't have any, but we didn't like that action, so we backed away from the, the stock at that point. And of course, that's turning out to not be the smartest move uh, on the planet because it's going higher. But this turkey just does not want to give it up uh, in terms of, uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, that you see a big supporting week here. You've got this heavy volume. That's when their secondary came out. And it's, it acts like it wants to go higher. And in fact, it is. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, people talking about IND. I mean, I, I talked about this last week. I think stock's dead in the water. Um, I've never seen a leading stock act so well and then just come apart and basically come straight down and all the way down to support. Now, to me, this is starting to look like a left shoulder ahead. And maybe it bounces to get a right shoulder in here. Maybe not very much. Maybe it's a shallow right shoulder and then goes lower. But there's something wrong here. Uh, you know, we blew out of this one pretty quickly. Tried to hold some on the, you know, since we were buying in here, tried to hold some on this break, but it just kind of comes apart. And there's nothing there. Somebody asked me, what do you think of TITN long? Uh, let's see. Dr. K, what do you think of that? TITN. Um, well, that, that must have been somebody in a fiat honking their horn. You got a good, uh, you got a good earnings report uh, a few days ago. Uh, Back to the 10 day. Yeah. You know, I guess here's the thing. Here's a Bible gap up. So there's your stop. Okay, you're close to it now. So if you wanted to buy the thing on this pullback, it seems pretty volatile to me though. But if you wanted to buy the thing on this pullback, you have relatively low risk 
using a low of 3066, which is less than two bucks below, so you know, six percent or so, it looks like. Uh, and that's really all there is there. So, you know, we're not here to tell you to buy something based on our opinion. Uh, SXCI acquired CHSI, somebody says, so that must have been. Um, I mean, I'm just curious, is there anybody out there who thinks Obama is the smartest president we've ever had? Do, do people really think he's that intelligent? Um, any, <laughs> let's see. I think we're preaching to the choir, though, when it comes to Yeah, probably, so probably, but, you know, anyways. I mean, and I'm not saying that Republicans are the answer either. I think the big problem is that they're all, Democrats and Republicans are all status, and I think no matter what happens, Romney wins the election, the market may like that, but I think you're still going to have this pervasive problem with uh, debt and uh, just increasing the debt ceiling and the amount of the national debt. It does not seem to be going away. And uh, on top of that, uh, uh, it, it, just, it, it just seems like it, at some point push is going to come to shove and something is going to snap. When that happens, I don't know. But that's one reason why I feel people should have you know ten percent, uh, maybe fifteen percent, uh, uh, in precious metals in gold and silver, physical, not ETFs. But uh, you know that's what I did a long time ago. I like some of the comments here. He is an imbecile, and anyone who voted for him is too. Yeah, they could have just been mis misled. I wouldn't be so harsh on people, you know. I do think though that the Obama campaign has a deal with uh, the the. People who makes the Prius, uh, Toyota, yeah, uh, it, that they actually come with an Obama sticker already on them when they sell them, and uh, <laughs> I think, I think that that <laughs> is is uh, really what what the deal is uh, with the Prius is. So, but I have to say, I saw someone get hit in a Prius. There were four people in the car. This is out near Torrey Pines, uh, north of San Diego in La Jolla. And they didn't hit that car, I'm going to say, more than, say, 15, 20 miles an hour. And nobody got out of that car. And look, it looked like a nice, you know, a tin can or, or a uh, soda can after somebody steps on it. And so um, <clears throat> you know, so, so I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't buy one of those. So <clears throat> um, let's see. I'm just going through some more questions. SXCI takeover. OK. Somebody's talking about borrowing TDX. Good luck. It's very hard to borrow inverse ETFs. Um, so here's someone else. Barely a shred of truth comes out of his mouth. It's like, yeah, you know, I think people got taken. Um, he reminds me of the guy. Anybody ever see the movie The Soul Man or Soul Man? It's about a guy. He comes from a rich family, and he's trying to get into Harvard, and he can't. His dad's cutting him off from his trust fund. So in order to get uh, a scholarship. It's a scholarship for African American students. What he does is he takes he takes an overdose of tanning pills. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a tanning pill. I don't know, Doctor, you ever heard of them? But the guy gets the tanning pills, and so he turns really dark in order to get a, a, a scholarship for African Americans. And to me, that's what Obama reminds me of—a guy who plays on the color of his skin when he's really just a white guy from from Punahou High School. And anybody who knows Punahou High School knows that that's not a high school for poor. Uh, Poor ghetto kids, uh, or even kids like me from the barrio. But anyways, um, okay. I'm going through questions here. Uh, VMware. Let's see. We already talked about those. Um, pay. Somebody's asking about uh, pay. Acts pretty well. This is another one hanging along the 10-day moving average. And I think you had a pocket pivot right here. Notice how things shakes out. There's a couple others that did this. Shakes out below the 10-day, and then the next day is a pocket pivot. There's actually these little pocket pivot-like moves all in here along the 10-day. It acts pretty well, and uh, but you know, again, it, I look at these, and when I see this kind of pattern, it's, it bothers me a little bit, and maybe it's just me. But you have this big run, and you have this big pod, and this thing just marching higher, marching higher. This is kind of a a QE rally is what they all look like to me. I mean, who knows for sure? But I think that. Uh, I see this big pattern, it makes me a little bit nervous. But on the other hand, you don't have to worry about that. You've been in a good trend here. Just watch how it acts. I guess violating, you know, you notice how it does hold that never violates a 20 day. I don't know if it's violating the 10 day in here, but you might use the 50 day as your ultimate downside guy. But it's, it looks okay. Somebody says a Prius is a good golf cart. 
I'm glad we're having fun today. Um, yeah, I guess so. I'd rather have a golf cart. It's probably safer. At least you can bail out of the golf cart if something's coming at you. Uh, or, you know, or it's about to run into something. Um, but I would not want to be run into or run into anything with a Prius uh, any day. So <laughs> eBay is a viable gap up and uh, coming out of this formation. So I would look at this as viable. Your low here is here. So I'm not sure, you know, if somebody wants to buy it. But eBay is something of a you know old leader that hasn't gone anywhere for a long time. If you think 17% earnings growth is something to get excited with, then I guess you could buy this. Um, but it is a Bible gap if you're using the low as your stop here. Romney, I think, is at least smart. Sometimes I wonder about Romney. I mean, the guy, the guy can answer questions a little bit better uh, than he does. He gets sheepish about his wealth, and you know, I say if you earned it. Screw everybody else, you know. I don't know. I came from nothing and made a lot of money. I don't recall running over any minorities on the way uh, up the ladder. Um, I, I ran over a lot of white guys, though, over age 55, so that probably will make the liberals happy. Um, uh, but, you know, this is. Just, I think he's kind of lame. He should be unabashed. Kind of like he should take on uh, Andrew Dice Clay's uh, attitude towards having wealth. He's like, you know, yeah. Uh, I won't say the line, but you all remember Andy Dice Clay. It's like, you know what? If you're rich, yeah, and you made the money yourself, yeah. Screw everybody else. We hear you're whining. Ah, must be an Obama lover. I would say if you're saying I'm whining, then you're a whiner. <clears throat> but, you know, seriously, if you can't see the flaws in the Obama administration, I think you're just blind to it. But there are a lot of blind people out there. Let's see. Fran in early January is a low-level pocket pivot. Um, oh, I guess, yeah, here, no, you know what? I don't know if I see that as a low-level pocket pivot myself. This is a cup with a handle. You actually have a rally here that is a good 30% up off the lows, maybe more than that. So that's an, enough of a prior rally here to call this a new base, and this is a cup with handle. So that actually, to me, is a breakout uh, from a cup with handle base. That's how I look at it. So not necessarily a low-level pocket. Because this is your base here. Would you see it the same way, Dr. K? Yeah, that's, uh, it looks fine. Oracle and has a short. No, I'm um, short of Oracle. Interesting, you have a Bible gap up, um, which could possibly be a Bible gap up on January 10th, simply because Fran um, is an IPO. So it's not, these IPOs, uh, you, they're not really bottom fishing uh, pocket, yeah. pocket pivots or Bible gap ups in this situation, although I would, I would also say that. You know, because Fran uh, seeming was seemingly uh, had a was in a downtrend, um, you, you you probably want to go in a smaller than normal size position on uh, January 10th if yeah. you decided to play that one. But you notice the gap up did fail, so you'd have been stopped out if you bought the Bible gap up, probably in here. So let's come back. Tractor supply is uh, you know you have this gap up out of these. Uh, Ascending uptrend channels. It's intuitive Surgical had the same thing, and of course it reminds me all of uh, not CGM but CMG. When you go back, you know here when it came out, it gapped out like that and it took off on a big run. And you see that happening today in Tractor Supply and Intuitive Surgical, which would seem to argue that these things want to go higher from here. But you know the other thing is it depends what stage of the market you're in. Are we towards the end of a, of a up leg here? We're going to go into correction for a few more weeks. You know maybe they will work, maybe they won't. My guess is that if my surge was going to be like CMG in 2010, it would have continued higher today, which it didn't. Tractor supply on the other end has continued higher, so maybe it's more like that. But it's a little bit halting, and I think it's some, something of a function of the general market. Uh, let's see. Going through some comments on pay, we talked about that. Um, let the Canadians run the country for ten years. I agree. Let the Canadians. I mean, I think they've done a smart thing uh, in terms of focusing on their their country's natural resource, uh, or producer of natural resources, and being able to develop a uh, trade surplus thereby. Somebody says Obama's smart, but an ideologue. Um, yeah, he's also a demagogue. He uses demagoguery, you know, the whole thing with millionaires and billionaires. The problem is, like California is finding out, there aren't a lot of millionaires and billionaires, and when you start uh, jumping all over them, they tend to disappear. 
Uh, somebody here says, I grew up in Chicago. Obama is a pure hustle. Uh, most politicians are. So, Come over to West... I live in West Los Angeles. Priuses are everywhere. Yeah. That's why I wish I had a tank. I'd run up on you. Or, or run them over, rather. Run up behind them. Run up behind on them and run them over. <laughs> okay. Still going through questions. Obama is more articulate than the Republican. I don't know. Have you listened to the guy talk? I mean, I guess are more articulate. That's probably not saying much. Uh, he's more articulate than George Bush. But the other thing is, you know, people who are slick talkers are exactly that slick talkers. So go go to a used car lot and you'll hear uh, 50 Obamas. But someone makes the point that neither party is working on the debt, and that is true. And to me, that is why. You know, let's make a comment on gold here. Uh, gold is doing nothing but hanging out in this big consolidation. Is this a big topping pattern that's going to break break down? I tend to look at this as, you know, you're making a higher low here on this pullback, so you may be rounding out. Maybe this is turning into a big reverse head and shoulders. Uh, who knows? But it's holding these lows here. I think if it continued to that, I'd be watching for gold to turn around. But, okay, you got any comments on the precious metals? I'm going to take a quick bathroom break. I'll be back in a minute, but maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, sure. Uh <clears throat> As we know, uh, gold and um, well, gold's been on a uptrend since 2001, and we've had a huge um, run in uh, 2011. Uh, I wouldn't call it a climax run, but certainly a, a nice run. Uh, silver had more of a climax top in 2011, but the climax top doesn't mean that it's over for silver. It just means that it's going to take a while before we start to see uh, silver break out of a proper uh, base in earnest. And I believe that silver and gold, because they correlate to a fair degree, um, are going to be in a uh, basing pattern longer than we expected. Uh, I know that earlier this uh, this year, gold and silver were coming up off their uh, off their lows in January and February, and it looked like that the basing pattern was going to be uh, shorter lived than we expected. But lo and behold, um, a lot of these basing patterns, especially with uh, these types of instruments will take longer than, than one can expect. And if you look at the, the uh, weekly chart of gold, um, its basing patterns are you know can typically be, uh, there was one that started um, in May of 2006, and it did not complete until September of 2007, or 16 months later. And then when it did complete, it was quite obvious from the price volume action, and it had a very nice run. Uh, same with uh, the, the base that started um, in uh, March of 2008, that did not complete until September 2009, or uh, 18 months later. So my guess, based on history, and on the one hand, we've got these uh, these charts that are showing uh, a basing pattern that's probably going to take a number uh, a number of months to complete. Um, this base in gold started in September of 2011. So on the basis of history, I wouldn't be surprised to see it complete in early 2013, which means we're going to be basing out all year in gold and silver. Now, on the other hand, we've got a lot of these central banks, uh, as we were saying earlier in the webinar, um, that are print. You know, they continue to print money. So you got to watch the price volume action. These base, this current basing pattern might complete before we think, and the clue will be uh, the price volume action and the constructive setups. Uh, that emerge, and the reasoning behind those constructive setups and uh, subsequent breakout will probably be QE. Yeah, and maybe that would be when QE three comes in. Whether that's going to be good for stocks is another issue, but I think definitely use pullbacks in gold. Uh, and I say, if you get under fifteen hundred, you definitely want to be buying physical gold uh, down there, and you use weakness in the metals to buy physical. We use the ETFs to play the trends when uh, gold and silver break out and start to trend because when they do trend, they trend very sharply and there's great profit potential there. So I think right now my view on gold is it's basing, like I think Dr. K, you agree there. And uh, it may take more time, but you may be getting to the lows, uh, you know, this pattern. I don't know if you're going to break down and test this low here, but it seems for now you have support down here. And I guess this is around above the 1500 level on the physical or on the futures. And uh, it looks, you know, like if it came down, I'd be using it to accumulate. I have bought gold. I first bought almost all of my gold back in 2000 when it was trading under 300. And I added again on this pullback here. Um, 
and I think it was somewhere around 800 bucks. I, I forget exactly. And that was the last time I added to physical holdings. The ETFs that we play when you get a breakout. And so right now it's just a matter of biding uh, your time with gold, using weakness to accumulate physical. Because I do believe strongly. I don't know where you come down on this, Dr. K, but I do. I think you have uh, various other hard assets to hedge as well. But I do think if there is a dollar devaluation, one day you're just going to wake up, and that's what's going to be happening. And if the dollar devalue is say 30 percent overnight, that can have a very deleterious effect on the stock market because it will create an instant asset allocation away from dollar-dominated assets in the short term, I believe. We'll see if that ever happens. But I do think that hard assets like gold uh, will shoot up in price. And you definitely want to have some uh, weighting 10% uh, you know, in precious metals. I put that much in back in 2000. It's a lot more now because it's been like a, almost a six-bagger. So. <clears throat> Obama is more articulate than the Republicans, and somebody else says, not without a teleprompter. And you know what? I think you're exactly right, because when you listen to him talk off the cuff, he's kind of a fool. I mean, maybe he sounds as dumb as I do off the cuff, but uh, I don't have a teleprompter. Um, you can also you diversify into Canadian and Australian no currencies. That is true. Dr. K? I was just saying he's no Clinton and he's no Kennedy. No. Somebody asked about CTC, CT, and I keep trying to get to this, and I keep forgetting. But you know, it's in a base, constant contact, uh, just in a base. I really can't say it doesn't hit any of my radar screens. I'm not sure why. There must be a reason here. Any reason why this doesn't hit? Nice tight base though. 91 relative strength. Uh, three quarters of earnings up pretty good. Sales up 21 percent. After tax quarterly margins, 14.1 percent. Yeah, it's it's okay. What you're looking for is some kind of a buy signal here. I don't know. This is a little V-shaped, so you get a pocket pivot right here. Uh, it might be a little too V-shaped, but you notice it is holding in tight. So, you know, if we wanted to buy this, I guess you could buy it here. But I'm not really in the mood to buy too much here right now. While we have some long positions, you know, we're ready to ski battle if things get worse. But at the same time, we'll go with the market direction model and have a hedge with uh, inverse ETFs. Great show today, guys. Thanks. I don't know what makes one great compared to any other one, but I'll take it for what it is. Thank you. Um, let's see. I mean, a lot of questions about the VIX. I, my personal feeling is that unless you feel you can handle the risk, um, I, I would stay away from it. You know, if you have too many questions about it, too many concerns, or you're confused, but just blow it off. CMO, Silicon Motion, uh, is that a viable gap up, Dr. K? CMO, hmm, let me see here. Well, uh, you know, the earnings are. And very it's earnings and sales are uh, impressive. Actually, uh, institutional sponsorships very in impressive as well. Uh, yeah, I would say this is viable. Viable gap up. Looks pretty yeah, good. I, I've liked this stock before, so this may work. You know, I don't know, but again, it's the general market environment. The problem is you'll see a lot of these uh, lesser stocks start to move up, uh, and then they'll break down real quickly. So if you do buy them, you know, keep tight stops on them. Has anyone uh, or small, rather it's a small cap? Name so it carries more risk. Uh, the market cap's only six hundred seventy million. Right. So keep that in mind. Yeah. So you never know. You know whether you get something like this where it acts well and then it just kind of breaks down again. Uh, Dr. K, have you ever tested the reverse pocket pivot scheme? I know a couple of people who've gotten into it. I don't think you really need reverse pocket pivots. I tend to short into rallies. So for example, with Amazon, to me this is a right shoulder. It's rallying up into the twenty day as it bounces off the fifty day and this trend line. So I'm shorting into it, so I'm not really looking for pocket pivots. But I have noticed that sometimes you will see a pocket pivot type move in reverse as a stock starts to roll over. A lot of times I'm short the stock before then. And if you guys recall, we were telling you all to get short GMCR here, and you know you could say, oh, this is a pocket pivot in reverse right here. But we were shorting the stock up in here. But yeah, that that would argue for a reverse pocket pivot or people who like to call a reverse cup and handle. Uh, I know I had some guy call me at the office and he says he's invented a new pattern, the reverse cup and handle. Um, and I had to say wrong. There was an article on reverse cups and handles like this. See this? Here's the reverse cup with the reverse handle and it breaks out. That's also a pocket pivot in reverse. I mean you can tur turn these all different ways and call them all kinds of stuff. Reverse, inverted, whatever you want to and get fancy. 
But to me, I'm shorting it throughout, so I don't really use that. Now, Dr. K, have you done any research on that? I don't think yeah. you have, right? No, I've done, I mean, years ago, and I went back to drawing board a couple times, and I never found anything. There's nothing. Uh, I mean, I, that's not that, it, that reverse pocket pivots can't work, but I have not found any reverse pocket pivot situation where over uh, a, a wide group of reverse pocket pivot trades, the risk was, uh, was tolerable. In other words, you get the signal on the sell side, you know, go short because you got a reverse pocket pivot, but the volatility was so large at that point mm -hmm. that uh, it wasn't worth taking the trade. Yeah. And therefore, it makes sense to shorten the rallies, shorten the weak rallies, shorten the wedging patterns. You know, we talked about that in our book, as opposed to actually using reverse pocket pivots, because reverse pocket pivots, it's just too late by then. Yeah, and, and for my money, you know, you already identify the pattern. I mean, short selling is much more specific in terms of our short selling candidates. Remember that your short sale idea list is the same list you use on the buy side while the market was going up. Okay, so you're not really doing any special screening, and then you're looking for these leaders breaking down, and as they're breaking down, they start to roll over, and I'm shorting into rallies into what I think are right shoulders. Uh, on occasion, on occasion, you'll have a situation like a, a breakdown from a right shoulder like you had with Netflix. So here's your, your left shoulder, your head, your right shoulders, a couple of right shoulders, and then you gap down. That sort of thing, I've found a downside gap that breaks either a neckline or some other level of support can work a lot like an upside gap. You can come after it using the high of the day as your stop on the upside. And I know we talked about this when this came out and we put out a report. I know a number of people on the website, members on the website, did make a lot of money on this as well as Green Mountain. Uh, so did I. But I find that this is more reliable. Is a, just a gap down break a lot of times will take things uh, you know, down much further if you're breaking down from a pattern. A lot of times a gap down break like this coming off of a peak is more susceptible to rallies. And if you think about this, this could be left shoulder, this could be a head, and this would it could have been a right shoulder if it broke down, but it didn't uh, because there's there's less uh, overhead and there's still it's less of a bearish pattern. So I find paying attention more to the macro pattern and the stock's position within, say, the right shoulder, and you're putting it out into a weak rally as opposed to going short on a reverse pocket pivot is more effective. Uh, and and Dr. K's studies show that that is the case. So you know, are you taking your vitamins? Somebody says, yeah, I do actually take my vitamins, and I'm happy to say that. Uh, because of the changes in my diet, including eliminating gluten entirely from my diet. Oh, you know, last night I had a dream that I ate a hamburger that had this tiny little burger, but this bun that was like two feet thick. I don't know, is that gluten deprivation uh, dream or something? But in any case, uh, huh. <laughs> uh, all my all my levels have dropped down. I don't know if anybody does blood tests, but you get this one. As you get older, I'm 52, you do this homocysteine levels, and I guess it tells you if there's inflammation in your arteries. I was like 15.6, normal is 11.4, and my doctor said that I had basically a heart attack waiting to happen. But in three months of changing my diets and uh, going on uh, various nutritional supplements, uh, I'm down to 11.5, so I'm just above normal. So I've gone back to normal. So. Can anybody tell that I'm, I feel I'm less uptight, less less uh, high blood pressure? Dr. K probably can. I'm always going off on him, but now you're still the same. <laughs> <laughs> GNC, uh, yeah, stock. You would use the 50-day moving average as your guide. Okay, so you have the Bible gap up. It has never violated it, but you do get these pullbacks and it's moving back up. So my guess is, as long as it can hold the 50-day moving average, it is okay. Um, I saw the other one, I think it's VSI, I, the reason I, I think of this is because it's almost like VOSI, uh, but it also broke out of this little cup with handle type pattern, and I think Herbalife is uh, acting similarly, so you know, these are acting okay, but you know, again, you're using your 50 day probably as a, as a guide on this one, and uh, on GMC, probably the same thing, so. But remember, if the model does go to a sell signal, I don't ever really have a problem. If I have long positions and, and they're at the top end of a range or something, I'll blow them out and, and I'll come back into them. And I've been doing that with LinkedIn. You know, it rallies up to the top here and sell it and it comes back in and rallies up again, sell it, it comes back in, buy it, and you just kind of trade it back and forth. I should be able to retire very soon uh, because I'm doing uh, channeling stocks, if anybody remembers that old commercial. Um, 
Let me see. I'm still going. <clears throat> Let's see if there's more questions here. Is there any reason to short a stock that breaks down like cores? All right, let's talk about this. I think this is useful. What do you have? You had a stock had a big run. You could start to look at this as a head and shoulders type formation because you have a shoulder here. This could be a head, and this might be a right shoulder. So yeah, this could be setting up as a top. So if you wanted to test this as a, as a little head and shoulders, which it could be, okay, you don't know for sure though. That's that's the trick, but you know that's what stops are for. And if you look at it on a weekly chart, you might say this is a left shoulder, not much of a left shoulder, and it's trying to form one here. But I'm going to guess that most of the heart is out of the watermelon on this stock. I don't think you'll ever see it break out and go to new highs. That's just my opinion. That's all it is is an opinion. But you know, I study the situation. I don't see where the big growth is coming from or what they have that's exciting or hot. But it, it definitely had a big move. And now, of course, everybody's seen this, and so they got enough suckers trying to come in and buy it here that maybe you form a little right shoulder. But theoretically, you could short it using the high of today as a stop if you wanted to test this as one of these narrow head and shoulders. And if you look at IPOs, some of them will have real hot moves, you know, and then they'll they'll set up in you know, a little head and shoulders, and they're done. Uh, and I think you saw that with some solars in 07. I've seen other IPOs earlier than that do that sort of thing. Uh, watching the market come off more. But yeah, that's a possibility. Um, and so if it sets up in the right pattern and it starts to show a right shoulder here, I think you're seeing enough weakness that you see the weak volume on the upside where you're trying to rally up into the 50 day. And notice you have the 10 and the 20 starting to roll over. The 10 days drop below the 50 day. There is no 200 day moving average. But yeah, there's potential here. Uh, for this to be uh, a little compact head and shoulders, an IPO type head and shoulders. So yeah, that's a possibility. And if you shorted it today or any of these other days, you probably would be using your highs, uh, your intraday highs somewhere here as a stop. I think it's 44.65. Uh, so that is, yes, that is a possibility. Nothing normal about you. Um, not really. I, you know, my wife would probably... Uh, <clears throat> Agree. <clears throat> Somebody says they remember that movie, Soul Man. <clears throat> oh, uh, Frank Zappa was normal yet named his kids Dweezil and Moon Unit. Hey, my, one of my kids is named Pocket Pivot, and and the other one is uh, is called Head and Shoulders. We call him Heady for short, but. Um, Dr. K, if he ever has kids, well, he's going to call them market direction. One name market, the other one direction, the other one model. But <clears throat> those just all be acronyms. MDM, yeah, I'm still going through. Uh, people are hanging in there. I'm amazed you guys are still in there. How is cores over? That's a good question. If it tops before it even forms its first official base, uh, because it had a big upside run. You know, it doesn't have to form its first official base. You could argue that this was a flag, an IPO flag down here. And uh, you know that's what you had here. IPO, you get a little flag formation, and it breaks out, and we get a pocket pivot bringing us in on that. And so you could say that was its first base, but it doesn't necessarily have to have a first base in order to top out. It could be one of these hot stock type things that rolls over. But I've noticed there are IPOs that will have big moves. They suck everybody in, and then they blow to pieces. So, you know, but you don't have to get into opinions about how is it. it. It is forming that way, and you can see that it is now below the 50-day, and it's finding resistance at the line there. So if you felt that this is starting to break down, you could short it. I mean, you could do any trade and take a, take a shot. You might uh, get stopped out, but I can see how this could pan out as a short sale setup. And I would only base it on whether this forms out as a head and shoulders. I would expect it to be a compact one, though, so don't expect much of a, a right shoulder here. Similar to maybe Crocs back when it broke down. Somebody asked about Theo. I'm not playing Theo. Uh, Fusion IO. Uh, the data storage stocks have been strong. STX, WDC, Western Digital, and, and uh, Seagate. This guy's dogging. You got a rally. It's kind of wedging. You know, there was some news about somebody buying them, Cisco or somebody. But yeah, you know, that's just news, and, and that may just set up a short. This thing may break down and be shortable, uh, for all we know. And in a way, you got this kind of a head and shoulders setting up. I don't know where the neckline is on this thing, but it, I think it's too weak. I wouldn't touch it. Does it become shortable? Possibly. Uh, let's see more questions. 
is the dog named Pod. We don't have a, a – well, we do have a dog, actually. No, his name is uh, – I forget what his name is. Uh, I don't know why I typed that in. I did want to point out, though, that there are these pod formations that bother me. You know, CMI is one of them. And you see a lot of stocks in these big, ugly formations. Um, CAP is another one. We talked about shorting that, where we were come, continuing to come down. Amazon is continuing to come down. I have those two stocks short up higher. Uh, but that sort of thing, you know, I'd be watching out for in terms of pods. And no, I haven't named my kids that. Uh, I'm 67, and folic acid is to low, supposed to lower homocysteine levels also. Okay, I'll check in that. I eat a lot of oranges. I know they have folic acid. At least that's what I'm told. Um, I'm just going to run through as many questions as I can. We're going uh, over, but I think this is a good day to be doing this. CTSH short. Um, you know, I've been looking at this one. I don't. This is kind of a pod type thing, so I don't know. It's breaking down, and this this has been weak. There's been another one. I think Infi Info. Whoops. Infy. You know, look at this thing. Kaboom! Nice gap down. Um, but it's been in a downtrend for a while. Believe it or not, my tailor, who is Indian, has owned this stock, I think, since it traded at 100 and something. I think he's been losing money or something like that. I don't know. So ever since, like, 99 when he bought it. Um, about, yeah, somewhere up in here he bought it. So where are we today? Try to come back. Try to come back. And it looks like it's pretty well toasty to me. So... But anyways, I do think if that, that this is another one that's similar in terms of the business outsourcing. Uh, it's breaking down from a pod, so is it shortable? Let's take a look at the daily. I suppose if you wanted to short it here, this is a pretty good size break. Uh, you, you'd use the 50 as your stop on the upside. It's pretty tight here, uh, so it could be a pod short. But it's still kind of early, so it's not clear to me that it necessarily will break down. If the market busts, it will bust. <clears throat> Somebody says they've been guilty of getting whipsawed out of good stocks. That happens. That's why you buy them back. Um, somebody describes politicians as all being, I won't say it. Somebody says my voice is perfect. No, I think that pretty much... Uh, covers all the questions we have right now. So... You know, we're on a sell signal. I'm just going to wrap it up here, I guess. Any other? Let's, let's take one last pass through here. Somebody asked if you would ever consider using options to trade the model. I can tell you Ross Haber uses uh, futures, and he does pretty well with futures. So I think if you're going to do that, you might try using futures. Um, options, you know, you're getting the same kind of volatility, same kind of leverage, so it might be similar. Still looking, see if we got anything here. No, I think we got all the questions covered. Just double checking. I want to make sure we get all the questions. Is fast a Fast to me looks like it's rolling over, but it's not a short sale setup yet. So let's just look at this. You do have, you could say this is a left shoulder. This is your break off the peak, so you're looking for a right shoulder to form. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure to hear. This needs more time to form. But again, you know, you're seeing leaders, some leaders doing this, and one of the first signs of a top will be you see some leaders start to break off the peak, and then there are waves of leaders that start to break down. We have some stocks acting well, so you're kind of in midstream here a little bit, and so in the short term, I treat the market as a market of stocks. That said, you know, I'm making some money on the short side with Amazon and Cat, and we'll see if anything else pans out uh, on the short side. But I think you only have a couple of uh, you know short sale candidates you're looking at right now that are setting up. If we see more that look good, um, then we will put them out. But fast is premature right now because you you have only had the, the first uh, break. But I want to point something out here. 
if you're looking to build a short sale list or a list of short sale candidates, if you think we're possibly starting a bear market or further correction and you want to be on top of it and be ready, which you should, what you're looking for right now is you're looking for stocks, leading stocks that have these big volume breakdowns off the peak because that's your first sign of a potential top. And then later on you will see them pan out and form right shoulders and that's when you're starting to look at them uh, as a short. Okay. But the breaks off the peak are your first signal that a leading stock is running into some trouble and may become a short sale candidate. So what you're doing is you can use IBD and look at the stocks down on volume. If it's a leading stock down on volume and you notice it looks like fast in terms of the break off the peak, then that should go on your list as something to keep an eye on as the pattern develops further. But you can't short it here, it's too early. What was the last stock you bought just on what you thought had great potential and good fundamentals but the chart was telling you no? I don't think it's usually the fundamentals are not that great and the chart is telling you yes. Does that work that way for you Dr. K? Yeah, that happens a lot more often <clears throat> where the chart is set up nicely but the fundamentals don't don't measure up and then you know it's best to avoid that situation. Yeah. And likewise, if the fundamentals look great but the technicals aren't there then by all means avoid that situation. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, can you comment on the light volume? Yeah, that's one of the things I think that bothers us about this market as well is that if you see this pattern, this rally that occurred, you had strong volume here, strong upside volume all the way up. And then notice as you got up into here, after this correction, you have lighter volume, okay? And you're starting to see a preponderance of higher downside days and, and distribution days are building up. And that's a little bit troublesome. Now, under the hood, you see some leading stocks act well. So again, you get you revert to this position of watching your stocks, treating the market as a market of stocks, and not allowing yourself to get scared out because the market can continue to come down in a normal, say, intermediate correction, seven, eight, ten percent, and leading stocks will hold up. So you don't, if you can, and you're oriented towards holding on, you can definitely stay in there. For my money, I'll usually just bail out, let the market come in, and then seek to re-enter if it bottoms out, has a follow-through day, because you'll usually see some stocks. Uh, breaking out at the same time or having profit pivots, so you'll have new areas uh, to move into. But you know there is that is troublesome. But again, that's sort of the QE environment. But it tells me, and this is one thing that runs through my mind, is that we know that markets come under distribution on the way up. They don't come and ring a bell and everybody on the planet throws you know their stocks out the window and they start selling them straight down. You will see signs of the top on the way up. And so if you look at this big distribution, big distribution, breaks down, then you move to highs again. You have this big churning day, it was an options expiration day uh, here. Let's see, let me get this right. Yeah, it's a churning day, you know, so, and you see this more volume picking up on the downside. So it could be that distribution started in here in some names and now we become more and more widespread. So what you're looking for now to confirm weakness in the market would be further breakdowns uh, in leading stocks. So if you don't see that, then you may just be going through a correction. The, the best stocks will hold up. That's where you want to go if the market turns on a follow through and then you just run it from there. Um, but yeah, that that is sort of bothering us, but we're on a sell signal right now. So take it from there, you know. And I think that's pretty much it. I don't have anything else. Dr. K, you got anything? I think we've done it. Yeah, we went over a little bit longer because we were late to make up for that, but uh, could be a pivotal day today going on a sell signal. To me, it seems logical. I know we get criticism uh, from, a, I'm going to say two or three people. You know, like we go to a buy signal and some guy emails us, that's the last straw. I'm canceling. What's the last straw that we put out a signal? And is it a wrong signal? You don't know yet. So jumping to conclusions, uh, acting in an emotional manner, that person should not be in the markets at all, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but I think if you're going to go to a sell signal, this is probably your best bet because you've got some overhead here, resistance here from this side, and the peak of this range may turn out to be the peak, and it rolls from here. That's all I got, you guys. Thanks for showing up. Remember to email us with any questions you have at info at uh, virtueofselfishinvesting.com. And uh, good luck. We'll see where this goes with the sell signal. Maybe it will work, and maybe we'll score on this one finally. All right. Take care, everyone. So long, everyone.